a deliberate attack. In the aftermath of Tuesday's hours-long shootout, today Jersey City officials saying the two suspects with high-powered weapons intentionally targeted a kosher market. The perpetrator stopped and began firing. And now investigators are looking into a possible link between a hate group and the attackers. We were targeted based on our faith and religion. Six people were killed, including both shooters, three innocent bystanders in the market, two originally from Brooklyn. And Detective Joseph Seals, a 39-year-old married father of five. Tonight, we're learning more about him and his bravery. Half of the class was crying, and I prayed like 10 times. And bullets riddled a nearby Catholic school, forcing students there to shelter in the basement. We'll hear from them about their ordeal. Currents News starts right now. Good evening, I'm Lydia Serrani. There are now many new details tonight about the Jersey City shootout. The attack on a kosher market was likely a targeted hate crime, and we're learning the names and more about the lives of those who were lost. Currents News' Emily Druby is in Jersey City. Emily? Lydia, officials have released the names of the two suspects and the four victims of this devastating attack. Now, directly behind me here is the kosher supermarket uh, that they say is the target of this attack. Now, officials are not releasing a, po a possible motive yet. Uh, right now, they say the investigation is just too fluid. Uh, now, here on the scene, community members are heartbroken. This definitely is a, a very hard time for everyone, especially for our community, uh, being that we were targeted based on our faith and religion. Morty Rubin has been helping with the aftermath of this terrifying gunfight at this Jersey City kosher supermarket. The bloodshed broke out around noon Tuesday. It started at Bayview Cemetery, where veteran Jersey City Police Detective Joseph Seals was shot and killed. The suspects being identified as David Anderson, seen here, and Francine Graham. They then drove a U-Haul to this kosher supermarket, where they immediately began to open fire. The frightening scene captured on security cameras. Jersey City Mayor Stephen Phillips says this is proof that the market was intentionally targeted. One person did managed to escape the carnage inside but was injured. What followed seemed never ending. The entire city on lockdown as Anderson and Graham battled with police for over three hours. Reports suggest Anderson has ties to the Black Hebrew Israelite movement, a designated hate group with no connection to mainstream Judaism. <laughs> In total, six people were killed, the two suspects, Detective Seals, and three others inside the grocery store. Officials naming them as Miguel Douglas, Moshe Deutsch, seen here, and the store's co-owner, Mindy Ferenz, also seen here. Two of the victims are originally from Brooklyn. Ruben tells us many people have moved to the area from Brooklyn because of rising prices. Mayor Phillips says this could have been an even more tragic situation if not for the quick response of officers. Um, the reason that those perpetrators seem to be inside of that deli and not able to move potentially to the school or to inflict more harm was because the police responded immediately and returned fire. In addition to the school, there is also a synagogue next to the supermarket. New Jersey's Governor Phil Murphy went there earlier to pray before heading to a news conference. Officials say there's absolutely no indication of further threats, but locals, some of whom didn't want to show their face, are still terrified. I feel very sad. It's a big tragedy for the community. You could uh, walk around and see at everyone's faces. It's uh, really it's hard. It's hard for everyone to digest. Sacred Heart Catholic School is right across the street from the attack. The building riddled with bullet holes. They were closed today, but yesterday students described the terrifying hours they sheltered in place last night. And I prayed like 10 times. The gunshots, it, it, it got so loud, the teacher had to throw stuff out of the closet and people had to get it. 
Officials did confirm today that they found a viable pipe bomb in the U-Haul that the suspects were driving. However, again, Governor Murphy is saying that there is no ongoing security concerns. Now, uh, attention is really being turned towards remembering these victims. There is a vigil being held tonight. Unfortunately, officials are saying that if you are planning on donating any money to the victims' families, you need to be very, very careful because fake fundraising uh, websites have popped up. In Jersey City, Emily Druby, Currents News. Thank you, Emily. A heartbreaking scene out there. Thank you. Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams is saying that the pain felt over the Jersey City shootout is sharp and knowing that two of the civilians killed were Brooklyn natives. He tweeted, this news further sharpens the pain of this mass shooting for our Jewish community. We mourn together. May their memories be a blessing. In the wake of the Jersey City shootout, the NYPD is on high alert. Police Commissioner Dermot Shea this morning said cops mobilized moments after the gunfight broke out. Almost immediately here as this was unfolding here in New York, we deployed our critical response units throughout the city to various Jewish locations. And that, that instant response was amplified, as the mayor said, throughout the night and continues to this point in time. Commissioner Shea insisted the anti-terror cops will remain deployed until the NYPD feels it's safe to remove them. The Archdiocese of Newark is praying for those killed in the Jersey City shootout. In a statement, the church said, Our prayers are with the slain victims, the fallen police officer, and their families, adding, We are grateful to all of the first responders for their selfless acts of courage and for the safety of all the students and staff of the schools in the vicinity, including Sacred Heart School. The Archdiocese is also thankful for the immediate response by staff at Sacred Heart in protecting the students. As Emily reported, the school was closed today. It will reopen tomorrow. The latest on the other crime story that we have been following, the attack on security guards at Washington's National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. The suspect seen here after surrendering to police is identified as Dorsey Mack. He's accused of hitting a female guard with a car and then slashing a male guard who tried to intervene. Cops say the incident appeared to be a domestic dispute. Monsignor Vito Bonanno, an ordained priest of the Brooklyn Diocese and now the director of pilgrimages of the shrine said it was evil. It was tragic. It could have been worse. That's the only reason why I think we all say we're grateful to God. It could have been worse. House Democrats are moving quickly to impeach President Donald Trump after bringing two charges against him. The next big step is set for tonight. Suzanne Malvo reports the very latest. The House Judiciary Committee will begin formal discussions on the articles of impeachment tonight, just one day after making this historic announcement. The House Committee on the Judiciary is introducing two articles of impeachment charging the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, with committing high crimes and misdemeanors. In their first article, House Democrats charging President Trump with abuse of power, saying that he solicited the interference of a foreign government, Ukraine, to publicly announce investigations that would benefit his reelection. It is an impeachable offense. The second article, obstruction of Congress, where they allege the president directed the unprecedented, categorical, and indiscriminate defiance of subpoenas of top White House officials. I wish the president's actions did not make it necessary. If we did not hold him accountable, he would continue to undermine our election. The committee will officially start considering amendments to the articles tomorrow morning, setting the stage for a possible floor vote by the full House next week. President Trump lashing out against Democrats, downplaying the historic nature of impeachment. All of these horrible things, remember? Bribery and this and that. Where are they? They send these two things, they're not even a crime. This is the lightest, weakest impeachment. But Democrats insisting they are acting on their oath. The argument, why don't you just wait, amounts to this. Why don't you just let him cheat in one more election? And that was Suzanne Malvo filing that report. She added that if impeachment happens, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is hoping to keep a Senate trial short and simple. 
Well, stay with us. St. John's University political expert Brian Brown will be here. He'll look at the impeachment battle, how it's uh, running into the next presidential election and more. That's still ahead right here in this newscast. Christmas was also on the table as Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio today hosted his Christmas luncheon. The main goal of the celebration is to benefit Catholic education and the evangelization of young people. Currents News' Tim Harfman has a story from Howard Beach in Queens. A time for Christmas cheer while providing the next generation with a Catholic education. Students from St. Michael Catholic Academy performing the nativity scene as hundreds pack Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio's Christmas luncheon. The gathering is raising over $350,000 so children can receive a Catholic education in Brooklyn and Queens. We have to remember them and, and pray for them and, and try to help them to do better. It gets us into the Christmas spirit of giving and, you know, to let people know that whatever they do, that the gifts that they have are to be shared. Bishop DiMarzio also acknowledging several people for their dedication to Catholic education. The honorees are pointing out how important the scholarships are. It gives the children a safe environment of learning. And also we don't have the public school like pressure of uh, learning and also we help the children how to pray. Vocations are nurtured in Catholic schools. So the more we can uh, have students in those schools, then obviously then we're also helping with vocations. Without the scholarships helping our families stay in Catholic education, uh, we would not be able to provide the consistency of keeping our enrollment relatively stable. The over 700 people in attendance agreed the Bishop's Christmas Luncheon is a great way to promote the future of Catholic education. In Howard Beach, Queens, Tim Harfman, Currents News. And tomorrow, Bishop DiMarzio will lead the Brooklyn Diocese in honoring Our Lady of Guadalupe on her feast day. Dressed in festive gear, faithful will head to Brooklyn St. Joseph's Co-Cathedral, where the bishop will celebrate noon mass. Then thousands of runners will set out on five different routes all over Brooklyn and Queens, torches in hand to express their devotion to the Blessed Mother at participating parishes. Currents News will have complete coverage tomorrow. Well, there's a lot more news headed your way. The FAA releases disturbing new documents following its investigation into two deadly crashes of Boeing 737s. And Catholics are being urged to pray the novena for Archbishop Sheen's beatification. And it's a beautiful day in one neighborhood in Iowa, a secret Santa's generous gift inspired by the kindness of Mr. Rogers. The chief of the Federal Aviation Administration grilled today over why the agency did not ground Boeing 737 MAX jets earlier. Stephen Dixon on the hot seat in front of House lawmakers. They wanted to know more about an FAA analysis that predicted the 737 MAX would crash. After the first jetliner went down, the agency determined that the aircraft was at serious risk of future crashes, but the FAA did not ground the planes until after a second crash. Today, Dixon defended the agency, saying it is, quote, data-driven. Those two crashes killed 346 people. With the impeachment battle looming in the Senate, coinciding with the start of the presidential primary season, 2020 is already shaping up to resemble something out of a political apocalypse. So what can we expect going forward? Joining me now with his thoughts is St. John's University political science professor, Brian Brown. Welcome back. Good to be here. Okay, so we all know by now that the two articles of impeachment against President Trump are abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. Now, do the Democrats have a leg to stand on with this? Well, I think what's happening is there's an internal struggle within the Democratic Party. And I think many Democrats were a little disappointed that only two articles of impeachment came out. They were hoping for more. Uh, others who are running in marginal districts that President Trump won in 2016 would likely Treasury want to get away from impeachment and are even talking about maybe they should have pursued censure instead. So only two articles of impeachment, not much to go on. Censure is not something that the president wanted, though. We no, know that. No, but it's a public rep reprimand. It's not as foreboding as impeachment and removal. 
Absolutely. Now, George Washington University law professor Jonathan Turley, who actually voted against the president, testified saying that requiring Congress to go through the courts to get testimony information from the executive branch is actually not obstruction of Congress. In fact, he suggests that the charge in it of itself is an abuse of power. What do you think? That was some interesting testimony, and I think it's important to note that it's only been 77 days since Speaker Pelosi said that they would move forward with the impeachment process. And in that time, it's been a very condensed, we've had a lot of hearings, explosive testimony, a lot of chatter in the media, but it's been a relatively tight period of time. I think had they pursued in the court some of those subpoenas that the president ignored, you know, they did not seem to want to go down that route. And instead, it's almost as if they wanted to get this wrapped up before the end of the year, and that's what it looks like is happening. Meanwhile, as we all know, that the inspector general reports that no evidence that the FBI had some kind of uh, deep state uh, conspiracy theater theories and were not possibly politically motivated when they launched the investigation into the 2016 Trump, Trump campaign, along with uh, Russian possible collusion there. At the same time, it was hardly a glowing report. Correct. What's your take on it? Well, I think it's important that you note at the start of the investigation, it seemed that there was no uh, implicit political bias. Uh, but as the report indicated from an independent law enforcement agency, that there really was some missteps and glaring mistakes along the way. And that does not serve well for the FBI uh, and those people who are involved in this investigation. And we heard the president actually last night saying how this is all being done because they're trying to make sure that he does not get reelected. Right. Primary season is just right around the corner. How, how likely is it this to affect his campaign? Well, it certainly is going to affect his campaign, and it will be a footnote in history that, you know, he is likely going to be the fourth president uh, to, to face the impeachment process. Uh, I think in the Senate, there are many senators running for president who don't want to be tied up in the month of January or longer dealing with this process. Sanders, Booker, Warren. So I think you're going to see a quick, speedy trial in the Senate. I think Senator Mitch McConnell is not going to make this a reality TV show as much as President Trump may want to see that happen. I think it's going to be quick and it will most likely result in uh, another acquittal. Well, thank you so much, Professor Brown. Again, St. John's University political science professor. Thank you. A novena for Archbishop Fulton Sheen is being organized by the Bishop of Peoria. The intention, according to Bishop Daniel Jenke, is to petition God unceasingly that Sheen's sainthood cause moves forward. The Archbishop's beatification is set for later this month, but was put on hold by the Vatican. The Diocese of Rochester reportedly requested that the delay until New York's Attorney General completes a clerical sex abuse investigation. Still to come on Currents News, making a difference, how the tablet's uh, bright Christmas fun is bringing joy and light to so many families this holiday season. And then inspiring hope, a Secret Santa special invite to a local theater is touching the lives of everyone in a small town in Iowa. The Tablet newspaper is dedicated to making sure every young Catholic has a bright Christmas. The campaign, launched during the Advent season, helps parishes and organizations give gifts to kids whose families struggle during this holiday season. The Tablet's editor-in-chief, Jorge Dominguez, is here now to talk all about it. So, Jorge, tell me, why is it so important, this campaign, for these children? It is very important, and for me, is personal. I, you know, I grew up in a country where Christmas was banned in Cuba, mm -hmm. but we celebrated Christmas at home. So I was celebrating Christmas, looking at a lot of kids that couldn't celebrate Christmas because their family were afraid to celebrate it, or because they do, they didn't know about it. So now for me, is the preoccupation is maybe we are all celebrating Christmas, and there is a kid there that cannot celebrate for any some reason. So the Christmas campaign is to make sure that that doesn't happen. That every kid in our eyes is cool celebrate Christmas this year and, and that's why we ask everybody to help this is the this is the bottom line absolutely it's something that we all take for granted just receiving gifts during Christmas now let's hear from some of those recipients of bright Christmas we've been able to take uh, adequate amount of funds 
and giving uh, Christmas gifts to each child. Uh, last year, we actually gave a $10 uh, Amazon gift card to each child with a personalized note, um, and each child was overjoyed just to simply get that card. We might be able to cover a Metro card for someone who started working at a job, or we might be able to buy special books or equipment for someone who started a new job that needs those items. So the, the Bright Christmas campaign really helps us provide for people who are working to get back on their feet and get out in the community. Obviously, those people are very thankful. What are other recipients saying to you? Oh, by the way, this is one of the best things of the campaign, receiving the letters, because when people apply for grants, they explain what they do with the grants. And, you know, a few days ago, I received a, a letter from the Make a Difference uh, in Christmas effort, and they, they are saying that last year, with the money we gave them, they sponsored 125 kids, and they hope another 1,000 kids get gifts from Christmas. This is one of the many, many letters that I receive. This is a, this is a great part of my job. Do you feel, you feel like Santa Claus? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and very quickly, how can someone donate? Well, you can write a check to the Bright Christmas Campaign and send it to the tablet, uh, 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn. Or this year, we have a new way. You can go to our website, thetablet.org, and you are going to see there the Bright Christmas Campaign link. You click on the link, and you can make a donation with your credit card, your debit card, or your PayPal account. High tech. High tech <laughs> Santa. Your, your beard isn't fully white, but you're basically Santa right here for so many kids. Thank you so much, Jorge Thank Dominguez, you for having the editor here. of The Tablet. Thank you. The Tablet needs your support to ensure that Catholic journalism will thrive well into the future. You can do so by purchasing the paper at your parish or subscribing to The Tablet so that it comes right to your mailbox. You'll save up to 55% by having it delivered to your home versus paying for it at church. Go to the website, thetablet.org slash home 55, or simply call 877-883-8356. And please check out one of the latest features in the tablet, the Our Diocesan Family page. That's where you can send in photos of your family receiving certain sacraments, such as baptism, first communion, confirmation, and marriage. For more information and to submit your pictures, just go to tablet dot org slash our diocesan family. Well, Santa Claus came early to a small town in Iowa and the gift he gave was too big to believe a golden ticket to everyone so they can watch a movie about his hero. The secret Saint Nick hoping that'll inspire some kindness during this Christmas season. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. It's the movie that's sure to make you smile. Tom Hanks portrays TV icon Mr. Rogers, known for his cozy cardigans and message of neighborly love. Grew up watching Mr. Rogers. The feel good film starts playing here in Webster City on December 20th. Enjoy the show. And the tiny theater that often struggles to remain open is bracing for a packed crowd. This has become the talk of the town. Everywhere I go, people are like, is it true? Is somebody gonna, is somebody really gonna pay for everybody to come to the movie? It's true. An anonymous donor is willing to shell out thousands. So anyone can come here to see the movie for free during its eight showings. Thank you. And as you can imagine, this neighborly act of kindness has everyone buzzing. That's pretty cool. It's a nice Christmas gift. So if you're wondering who it is, Sorry, but you'll never know. I think the, the definition of charity is to out the expectation of any return. The local secret Santa won't reveal his identity, but he will say the reason behind the gift is to encourage people to be more like his hero, Mr. Rogers. Let's make the most of this. If you can take nothing else away from this, be inspired to be kind to one another. Could you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you be my neighbor? What an amazing act of kindness. I'm sure Mr. Rogers would be proud. And Jorge, we definitely need some more Mr. Rogers in the world today, right? In these times we live in, yes. Absolutely. Well, that's Currents News. I'm Lydia Serrani. Thank you so much for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time. Good night.